All right, so we're up to our final psalm, uh, Psalm 24, and then uh, from next week we'll be going to uh, 2 Peter. We come in 2 Peter, the three chapters there, and that should bring me toward the end of my service here uh, full time with you guys. But uh, if you look at Psalm 24 and verse number one, I couldn't help but just start with that first phrase there. It's a great title for the sermon. It starts off by saying, The earth is the Lord's. Okay, so this is a great reminder. That's the title for the sermon this afternoon. The earth is the Lord's. And I think this is just a, a great reminder, especially in this day and age, this pandemic, the concerns, you know, the, the government, uh, uh, I guess, overbearing themselves, you know, uh, putting these uh, restrictions that might not be uh, necessarily right. Or, you know, there are lots of fears, so lots of concerns. And, you know, there are a lot of people just uh, yesterday you know, throughout Australia, different cities, we had a lot of people marching in the streets and saying this is wrong, you know, uh, you know uh, protesting the restrictions, protesting what's going on in Victoria, all these, these things. But as, as God's people, as Christians, we have the Bible, which is so great, which reminds us that the earth is the Lord's. Look at verse number one. It says, and the fullness thereof. It's not just that this world belongs to Him. It's not just this, this planet. It says the world and they that dwell in them, they're in. So there's, there's a few things here that, that we're reminded of that belongs to God. Yes, this world. Yes, this creation. But the fullness of everything that is in this world, all the resources, you know, all, all the, the wealth of this world, all of it belongs to the Lord, this world. And then it says, and they that dwell therein. Everybody belongs to God. Now, not everybody are children of God. We know that to become a child of God, we must be born again into His family. But the Lord God owns everything. And that should really give us a lot of comfort, a lot of peace in, in this day and age, you know, within these concerns that people have. And, you know, people say, well, you know, the governments, they're taking away our rights and we need to protest. We need to stand up for our rights. You know what? Everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. You know, even the government belongs to God. All the authorities, you know, belong to God. Please keep your finger there and go to Colossians chapter 1. Go to Colossians chapter 1. And uh, I just love the reminder that God owns all things. And that truly should give us great peace. You know, as His children. As we've been reminded this morning how the Heavenly Father loves His children. Well, you know what? No matter how wicked this world gets... Just remind yourself that the Lord loves you and is seeking to guide you no matter how bad the environment gets around us. But Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, Colossians chapter 1 verse 12, let's remind ourselves of this great truth. It says here, giving thanks unto the Father, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and have translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Wow. You know what? We're not part of some earthly kingdom. We're part of the kingdom of His dear Son. He's translated. When you got saved, He brought you from the kingdom of this wickedness, this, this dark kingdom, the kingdom of this world. He's brought you into the kingdom of God. You are kings and priests in the holy nation of God. Verse number 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now notice verse number 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. Look at this. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Then it says this. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things and by Him all things consist. What an amazing truth. You know, Jesus Christ has the authority over all things. All things in heaven, all things in earth, whether visible or invisible. And we know that we're fighting a spiritual war against the, the, the forces of wickedness, which we cannot see with our natural eyes. Those things that are invisible. You know what? Even Jesus has ultimate power and authority over all these things. The government's becoming wicked. The Antichrist is, is on the scene. Is, you know, the tribulation is, is you know, a few months away. Whatever it is that people talk about, whatever it is, that, I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying whatever people are concerned and worried about, don't worry about it. Jesus is in charge. He's in control of all things. All things were created for Jesus. And Jesus is my Savior. His Father is my Father. 
He's in charge. He's in control of it all, brethren. God's not out of... He hasn't lost control of this world. I know we look at this world and we say, this world is out of control. And it is. Say, this world is wicked. Yes, it is. This world is sinful. Yes, it is. But God knows. He's in control. He knows what's going on. And He's watching after you. He's looking out for you. Okay? Listen, we don't need to march the streets. We don't need to protest for our rights. We are children of God. We've been translated into His kingdom. We have, all, we have everything that God wants to offer us. Okay? He wants us to live in faith. He wants us to keep our minds on all eternity. You know, this is something that's reminded to us throughout the entire Bible. We see there in Psalms that God owns all things. The whole earth is His. We see here in Colossians that He has authority over all things. We're even reminded in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 10, it says, The four and twenty elders fall down before Him that sat on the throne and worship Him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, What do they say? They say this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And then it says this, For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We're reminded from the very beginning, we know God created all things, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we're reminded throughout the entire Bible, hey, believers, hey, children of God, remember, God owns all things. He has all power. He has all authority. Pastor Kevin, are you concerned about this world? Are you concerned about the governments? Not really. No. Because my Heavenly Father knows it all. He's in charge. It's all under His authority. Okay? And God's going to judge them at the right time. God's going to look after us. God's going to look out for us. He's going to provide all our needs. It doesn't matter how wicked this world gets. It just means we have to shine brighter as, as, as the light in this world that you know, Jesus Christ has left us, the responsibilities that He's left us to do. Can you please go to Psalm 50? Go to Psalm 50. Psalm 50 verse 10. Psalm 50 verse 10. Just another reminder here, it says in Psalm 50, 10, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Hey, every animal belongs to God. Every cattle on every hill, on a thousand hills, it all belongs to God. Okay? It all belongs to Him ultimately. It's all the Lord's. Look at verse number 11. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. All the birds, all the beasts, all the animals belongs to God. And I love what it says in verse number 12, very poetic here. This is God speaking, of course. He says, if I were hungry, now, obviously God is not limited like us, okay? He's not going to be hungry. But he says, if I were hungry, all right, if I, if I had needs, if I needed to be satisfied, if I needed something, he says, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. God says, look, if I needed anything, if I was hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. I'd just take it because it's all mine. It's not like God has to ask permission. It's not, it's not like, you know, uh, you know, you might own a piece of land, for example. I, I don't know. You don't really own the piece of land. The government <laughs> you know, owns, owns your land, right? God doesn't have to ask permission from the Australian government to take his land. It's all his. Okay, all the animals, anything on that land, anything on this earth belongs to God. He doesn't have to tell any of us. He just takes it because it's his. Amen. Okay? And I, I love that about God, that He is in charge, He's in command, right? Nobody can say no to God. If you were hungry, he would, take, he would take care of that. Now, please go to Job chapter 1. You're not far from Job. Please go to Job. It's important for us to turn to Job chapter 1, verse 20. You might say, Pastor Kevin, are you against people protesting? I'm not. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's within people's rights to make known their concerns, their issues, but brethren, as I've been preaching throughout the last few months, right, this is not the world I'm living for. This is not, in fact, the worse this world gets, the greater the opportunities for us to preach the gospel. Honestly, the worse this world gets, the more fear, the more concerns about the future. People will start asking about God. Australians will start having a fear of God. It only works in our favor. You know, because God will be able to use us in a great and powerful way. It's almost better. Things just get worse. Amen. Okay? Because if Australians just continue down this world, of, you know, this, this, uh, this prosperity and, and the comforts of Australia, the, the more we have in, in this nation, the more people say, well, I don't need God. I'm a self-made man. Well, why do I need God? I'm living, I'm living fine. Right now, Australia is a beautiful country. 
But we really need things to get bad for people to start having a fear of God and turning back to God, looking to Him for comfort. That's where we step in. That's where we can show people the gospel, show them salvation in Jesus Christ. So I'm not concerned about things getting worse. I just think it's better for us. <laughs> better for our gospel message, right? We'll be able to see more people saved than we've seen before. But look at Job chapter 1, verse 20. And I think it's important for us as believers, Job, who of course was upright and perfect, perfect and upright, right, for his generation. Look how he responds. Remember, Job loses everything. He loses all his possessions. He was a rich man. He had a great family. He loses his children as well, right? And this is how he speaks in Job 1, 20. And Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Listen, when you lose it all, when you lose everything you have, brethren, can you be like Job and just worship God? Look at verse 21. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave. Hey, we love it when the Lord gives. The Lord gave. Hey, man, we have our God-given rights in this country. I love it when God gave. Amen. All right. And the Lord hath taken away. Hey, if we lose our rights, the Lord's taken it away. That's what it says, right? The Lord takes it away. And then it says there, uh, sorry, I've lost my spot. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, right? The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So he says, look, yeah, I, I have all my rights, I have all my possessions, I have all my riches, I'm going to bless God. You know what, if God takes it all, all away, yes, he has ultimate authority in this world, if I lose it all, and he did lose it all, he says, I'm still going to bless God, I'm still going to worship God. Hey, that's the attitude we have in this world. This is how we ought to be as Christians, not whining and complaining and, and living for this world, living for temporal things that really don't matter for all eternity. You can march down the street. Hey, you might win back one of your rights. But listen, that means nothing for eternity. <laughs> Honestly, it means nothing for eternity. What we do, brethren, what we are living for, the kingdom of God, for His gospel message, to, to live righteously, to live a life that is pleasing to God, to, to give Him praise, to give Him thanks for everything He's given. Yes, but also everything is taken away. We ought to give thanks to God. And so listen, if the Lord takes things away, if we lose more and more of our rights, if the government takes more and more of my money, I'm just going to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. God, it's all yours anyway. If, it's all, if it all disappears, it disappears, Lord. You must have a reason for this. You must have a reason. You must have a purpose for this. Please go to the next chapter, Job chapter 2. And it's not Job. It's not just one passage that says this. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 15, I'll just read it to you, says... As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked, shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. Brethren, we come in with nothing, we're going to leave with nothing. Okay? You're not going to take any of your earthly possessions, you're not going to take your Australian constitution, you're not going to take the, the laws of this land with you to, to, to heaven. It's all, it's, it's all empty. It's all, it's all gone, right? It's there for a reason, yeah, to live our lives on this earth, but it doesn't matter. We, if we lose it all, we lose it all, and we are going to lose it all when we pass away. But you're in Job chapter 2, verse 9. Job chapter 2, verse 9. And I, I feel for Job's wife. I know Job's wife cops it pretty hard when it comes to preaching. I get it. But I can understand a, a mother losing all her children. I can understand her not being happy about it. I can understand her getting angry about it, right? So I don't, I don't really like to attack Job's wife here, even though she's wrong. Verse number nine, it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Hey, it's pretty wicked to curse God, right? And how does he respond? And he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did Job not sin with his lips. Listen, God can give, God can take. Okay, but not only can he take that which is good, he might allow you to have some evil in your life. Okay, are you going to retain your integrity when God gives you evil in your life? Allows you to go through evil, to be harmed? 
you know, and Job's attitude is, look, God can give us good, He can allow us to go for evil. He can give us evil as well, okay? And if, our, if we lose all our rights, if we lose, I don't know, whatever it is, brethren, I don't know what's going to happen in this world. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think things are going to get back to normal. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. I, just, I don't think things will go back to the pre-COVID world. I think we're going to be, get used to this new normal because that's what they're all pushing these days, right? I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not, sh- I'm not saying that I'm fine with it. I'm not saying that, okay? But even if I'm not fine with it, even if it causes evil in our lives, listen, we just have to maintain our integrity and just bless God, just worship God and function in the new society that we live in, okay? And why? Because the earth is the Lord's. God's in charge of it all. He owns it all, okay? And He knows that we're going to have to maybe adjust a little bit how we do things in the new normal, okay? I'm not promoting the new normal. I hate it! Okay, I wish things would go back before all of this stuff, okay? Please go back to Psalm 24, verse number 2. Psalm 24, verse number 2. Why is the earth the Lord's? Well, verse number 2 explains, For he have founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. So, of course, God's the creator. That's why he owns it all, because he created it, right? God created all these things. And if you can keep your finger there, go to Genesis for me. Go to Genesis I think it's quite interesting, this verse. I don't want to skip over it because it says he have founded it upon the seas, the earth, okay, and established it upon the floods. Now, let's just quickly remind ourselves what creation was like. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, okay, Genesis 1, 1, let's just think about what does this mean. So the earth is founded upon the seas. Well, Genesis 1, 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now notice the next part. It says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so when, when, on day one, when God created the heaven and the earth, the earth was covered by water. Okay? And so then He needs to create the dry land. Right? So when we, when we get that idea that the earth is the Lord's, and earth, of course, is not just the, the, the planet, but also the dry ground. The Bible quite often refers to earth like that. So what we understand here, if you drop down to verse number 9, we see how God established it upon the seas, in a sense. Genesis 1.9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Okay? And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. All right? So that's how we understand then. Verse number 2, it says, He had found it upon the seas, the earth, is because it was all sea, it was all water, and then God allowed the water to be pushed aside, you know, to be made into seas and oceans and the dry land to appear, okay? And so we have our continents and we have, you know, the dry land that we, that we live on. And so, yes, in, in a sense, in that sense, yes, the, the earth was founded upon the seas because it was the seas first before the earth appeared. But it also says in verse number two, and established it upon the floods. So it's not just, and I find this quite interesting, it's not just that the waters were pushed aside for dry land to appear, but also, the dry land, the earth, is also founded upon the floods. So what this is saying is, basically, that there is water under the crust of the earth. There is water under this earth. And, you know, that might sound unusual. And I just wanted to quickly look this up. This isn't some secret, you know, uh, thing. This isn't some weird, you know, science. This is actually a well-established science. And actually, before I read it to you, I'll just read to you uh, Psalm 136, verse 6. It says, To him that stretched out the earth above the waters for his mercy endureth forever. That's Psalm 136, verse 6. I'll just read it again. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters. So saying, look, above, um, under the dry ground, there's water, God is saying, right? And uh, this doesn't take long. You just Google, just Google water under the crust, water under the earth. Just Google that. There are so many articles about this. This is a well-known science. And the one that came up first, I'll just read it to you, is from, the new sci- it's from newscientist.com. And this article is written on the 12th of June, 2014. And it says this. It says that a, a reservoir of, of water, three times, look at this, three times the volume of all the oceans has been discovered deep beneath the Earth's surface. The finding could help explain where Earth's seas came from. I don't, I don't think so, but anyway. <laughs> you know, so it, obviously these articles go into evolution and the Big Bang and all that stuff, okay? But this is something that has become 
widespread information. There is water under the crust. You know, three times the amount of, of the oceans. Think about how, many wa- how much water there is in the oceans, right? There's three times as much water under the crust of the earth. It also says, in another part of the article, it says, the water is hidden inside a blue rock called Ringwoodite that lies 700 kilometers underground in the mantle, the layer of hot rock between earth's surface and its core. And so when we read this in the Bible, you know, I guess before we had the scientific understanding, we might just read over this or we might say, well, this is just poetic language in some sense. No, actually, there is water under the crust. God did establish you know, the earth above the waters, you know, so it, it, you know, it's just amazing that science just comes to the realization of what the Bible already tells us, Amen. you know, we, we have, we're, we're ahead of the scientists, if we just believe what the Word of God says, all right, go back to Psalm 24, I thought that was interesting, Psalm 24, verse 3, and then it says this, who shall ascend into the hill of God, or who shall stand in his holy place, so what is the hill of the Lord here? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Please go to Psalm 48, Psalm 48, verse 1. Psalm 48, verse 1. The hill of the Lord, it's, not, it's actually mentioned quite a lot. Not just the hill, but the mountain of the Lord. Psalm 48, verse 1 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion, on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Amen? So what we see here, this, this hill of the Lord, this mountain of the Lord, where it has the holiness of God, it is Mount Zion. Mount Zion. You say, what is Mount Zion? Well, first of all, it says there in, in Psalm 48 verse 1, it is a city, it is the city of our God, right? It is the mountain of His holiness. It is, the, it is a place of His presence, and of course, if you just read, you know, casually read for the Old Testament, you know, you'll come to no other realization that Mount Zion is basically Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem, the, the city of Jerusalem is Mount Zion in a physical sense, okay? But let's keep, go back to Psalm uh, 20, uh, yeah, 24, verse number 3. Let's, let's read it a little bit more. Verse number 4, because it's asking the question, who can ascend to this hill? Now, obviously, going to Jerusalem is not a big deal. You know, you can catch a flight to Jerusalem and go to Mount Zion, okay? This is sounding like something very specific, something very unique, something very special. You know, who can come to this hill of the Lord? So is it just Jerusalem? Well, it's not, because look at verse number four. Who is it that can stand in his holy place? Verse number four. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, he who, he, uh, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Now, brethren, can you say about yourself that you have clean hands? You've never done anything wrong. You've never committed any sins. Can you say that you have a pure heart? You know, that, that, that you, you've never had a wicked thought in your heart at all. Can you say you've never lifted up your soul unto vanity? You've never been lifted up with pride and, and thought highly of yourself above your station. You know, is that, is that you? Well, obviously, all of us are sinners, okay? All of us are sinners. And all of us, you know, even, no matter how wicked of a sin, sinner you are, in fact, there are many wicked sinners in Jerusalem right now, okay? I mean, the, 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 the most wicked, one of the most wicked religions in this world is Judaism, denying Jesus Christ as the Son of God. There is plenty of wickedness right now in that city, okay? So is this about then? Yes, yes, it is, you know, about... Jerusalem in a sense, of course. You know, in Old Testament times, when the people of God were there, you know, and the temple of God was situated there, they would bring the sacrifices. Yeah, it was meant to be a holy place. It was meant to be a special place. It was a place where they would uh, go to the Lord and ask for forgiveness for their sins, yes. But you know what? It's just a type. It's just a picture of the true Mount Zion. So let's have a look at that. Go to your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's have a look at the true Mount Zion. Let's have a look at the true Jerusalem, okay? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. And remember, only if you've got clean hands, only if you've got a pure heart, (laughs) you know, only if your soul has not been lifted up into vanity, only if you've not sworn deceitfully can you enter this Mount Zion. And you've already failed. So how do we go there? Well, it's common sense, common knowledge in this church anyway. You must be saved. Right? Have your sins forgiven. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Okay? 
and then it's our righteousness, not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ that allows us to enter into that place of holiness, right? Then we can have the pure hands. Then we can have the clean heart, etc., to enter this Mount Zion. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion. What Mount Zion? Is this uh, Jerusalem? Well, it is. Because look, and unto the city of the... We saw there was a city. Unto the city of the living God. But then it says this, The heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels. So listen, yes, you know, uh, the city today in Jerusalem, it has no significance today. I do believe Christ is coming back. I do believe he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem, okay? But like many things in the Old Testament, it's just a type. It's meant to help us understand a greater spiritual or heavenly truth. There is a Mount Zion. There is a heavenly Jerusalem. It's in heaven. It's in the presence of God. And listen, no wicked sinner can enter heaven unless they've been saved, unless they've been cleansed from their sins through Jesus Christ. Let's have a look at that, that, this city, verse number 23. It says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. You say, I want to be in that church. You will be, don't worry. When we get to heaven, the church of the congregation, we're all going to be together, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So how do we enter into this Mount Zion? How can we have access? Who can enter this, brethren? As the question gets asked there. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? The question gets asked in the psalm. Well, those that have had the blood of sprinkling of Jesus Christ, those that have entered into the new covenant, right? We have access because we have the clean and pure heart, because Jesus has paid for all our sins. Amen. Amen. Thank Jesus that we can enjoy this Mount Zion, that we can enjoy this heavenly Jerusalem. Brethren, I don't, you know, I, I, I would be interested in going to Israel one day, I'll just be honest with you. I'd be, I'd be interested to look at the sites, to look at the locations. I think it will help me better grasp the geography of the land as I read through the Bible. But if I never do that... I want to make sure just I don't miss the heavenly Jerusalem, right? I don't want to miss the true Mount Zion, the one that really matters for all eternity. And so listen, brethren, we may, we may never walk the Holy Land, okay? But there is a greater Holy Land that we must all participate in, you know, it's salvation through Jesus Christ, this heavenly Jerusalem. And there is a church in heaven, the church of the firstborn, okay? You know, we don't believe in the universal ch church doctrine here, but one day there will be, yeah, a singular church in heaven, all the believers making up this church of the firstborn. Remember, you have to be born again, okay? The firstborn, of course, Jesus Christ being the first begotten from the dead. Back to Psalm 24, verse 5. Psalm 24, verse 5. It says, He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Now, I don't want you to miss this. And it ties into everything that we just covered. The fact that we must enter in with the clean hands and the pure heart, etc., it says, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So important for you to understand this, brethren. We are not saved by our own righteousness. Our own righteousness does not prove salvation. A lot of people can do good things. You know what? There might even be, and I'm not saying this is good, I'm just saying there might be unsaved people that behave better than some people in this church. It could be, okay? But your own righteousness does not get you saved. It, it doesn't hit the mark, brethren. It doesn't come close. So what is it? We receive the blessing from the Lord. Look at this. And righteousness from who? From God, all right? Righteousness from the God of His salvation. Listen, the way we enter that Mount Zion, the way we go to heaven is through the righteousness of God. Through the righteousness of his son. Okay? You know, there's this whole, well, you must, this is how, you know, the false preachers, the false gospel, that they'll say, well, salvation is by believing in Jesus, but you've got to have the works. You've got to have the righteousness. You've got to start it, because if you don't, you're not saved. Listen, salvation is through Jesus Christ, it's his righteousness. 100% the righteousness of Christ. It's not 90% the righteousness of Christ and 10% of mine. It's not. It's not like I have to try 10%, but Jesus will cover the other 90% for me. It's not like that. 
It's either Jesus 100% or you try 100% on your own. And you've already failed. So you might as well not try on your own. You know, salvation is without works, without the deeds of the law, without the works of the law, not by our own righteousness. Please turn to uh, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. The righteousness from the God of his salvation. What a blessing. That's the greatest blessing of all, brethren. Wow, that I can have the righteousness of Jesus in my life, even though I know I'm not perfect. Even though I know I still make mistakes. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. Romans chapter 9, verse 30 says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, now remember the Gentiles for the Jews were the unclean people, right? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness, listen, they've not followed after righteousness, the Gentiles, meaning they're not doing righteous things. They're wicked people. They're committing sin, is what it's saying there, right? They're not following after righteousness have attained to righteousness. What? So they're not trying to live righteously, but they've still attained righteousness? Yeah, they have. How? Even the righteousness which is of faith. How do I get right with God? Even though I'm a sinner, how do I get right with God? Faith on Jesus Christ. That's how you you have the righteousness of Christ. It's imputed righteousness. It's not our own righteousness that gets us saved. You know, I don't look at someone in this church and say, wow, that's a great guy. What a great person. I know he's saved because he's such a great guy. I don't think like that at all. I think, hey, if you have a testimony of your faith on Jesus Christ, then I know you have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Then I know you're saved. You say, but what if you catch him drinking alcohol after church? Well, you know what? We ca- well, that's one of the sins you've got to kick someone out of church for, right? Being a drunkard. But here's the thing. He's still saved if his faith is on Jesus. And hopefully he repents from that. Hopefully he turns from that. Okay? But whether he does or not does not change his direction. He's still saved. It's the righteousness of Christ that saves him. Right? Just like it said here. That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, just like the drunkard drinking the alcohol afterwards. Right? He's not following after righteousness. But he attains the righteousness through faith. Okay? The faith. Look at verse number 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness. Now, now this is Israel. This is Old Testament Israel. They're trying to follow the laws of God. They're trying to follow the commandments, right? The law of righteousness. And this is this. Have not obtained, have not attained to the law of righteousness. What? Yeah. Salvation is not by keeping God's laws. No matter how much you try. The Jews tried a lot. Okay? They did not attain righteousness through the law, right? Verse number 32. Wherefore? Why? Right? Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith but as it were by the works of the law for they stumbled at the stumbling stone as it is written behold i lay in zion remember the mount zion zion a stumbling block and rock of offense and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed how is it then that we attain the righteousness brethren through the laws through the law of god through his commandments no okay that's not how that's not what we should be place now faith on the works that we do in his law no it is simply by believing Belie- what did it say there uh verse sorry verse number and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed believing your faith your faith on jesus okay how did the old testament saints get saved by believing on jesus by believing on christ by believing on the sacrifice of God. Yes, they had to obey the laws. Yes, they had to obey the commandments because God will either bless them or curse them on the land, whether they did or not. And brethren, yes, we ought to obey the commandments of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay? And listen, I would never come behind this pulpit and say, we don't have to keep the commandments. But to be saved... Yeah, it's not the commandments that save you, brethren. It's your faith on Christ. And now that you are saved, you know, we don't need to rehash that over and over again every Sunday, do we? Now that we are saved, we say, well, now we want to live after the righteousness, but it's righteousness through Christ. Okay? And listen, when you still fail, you know, you can go to Christ and ask for forgiveness and thank God that we're not going to be judged for heaven based on how well we're living after we got saved. Now, we should live well. I'm going to try to focus a lot of my sermons on living well. That's what we preach on all the time, right? I can't preach about salvation every week. We preach on living Christ-like, being godly. But whether you do or not is not the basis of your salvation, okay? Your basis of salvation is your faith 
on Christ. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So does the law serve a purpose? Absolutely. It teaches us that we're sinners. The law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ and say, wow, God, these are your laws, these are your commandments. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Oh, man, I did that. What do I do now? I failed. That's what it's meant to do, right? I failed. I've got to try harder. I've got to try to get saved. Try harder. Keeping his commandments? No. Okay? That's not what it says. It says, uh, we'll not be justified in his sight. Verse number 21. But now, the righteousness of God. Okay? The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Look, even the Old Testament prophets knew it's the righteousness of God that saves us. Okay? Verse number 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by, again, by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And he goes, you know, obviously the no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Gentile and, and, and the Israelites. Okay? So we need the righteousness of God to be saved. We need the righteousness of Jesus. We need His imputed righteousness in our lives. How do we get it? By following the commandments? No. We get it by our faith upon Him, without the deeds of the law, without the works of the law. And once you are saved, praise God, you know that your salvation is based purely on Christ. Now that you are saved, well, now I better try to live for God. Now I better try to follow His commandments so I can please Him, so He can bless me, so He can reward me, right? That should be our desire. But I, 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 I despise it when people mix this up. Right. It's such a mess. It's such a corruption of God's gospel. Okay, back to Psalm 24, verse 6. Psalm 24, verse 6. It says, This is the generation. These are the people that go into Mount Zion, the saved. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Salah. Okay, so seeking the face, seeking the face of God is basically seeking favor with God. That's kind of the idea, right? Seeking favor. I want God to show His favor, His mercy, His love toward me. Of course, again, only available for, through Christ. But there is this idea here that we need to seek Him, right? Seek God. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him him okay a rewarder of them that diligently seek him now yes i guess we can take this verse and apply it to salvation i i we can okay but salvation is not a reward okay it says here he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him salvation is not a reward salvation is a gift yeah. gifts are free okay what are rewards you've put an effort you've tried hard you get a reward Right? My kids play soccer. If they're the star player of the match, they'll get a McDonald's voucher. That's their reward for playing well. Okay? That's the effort. That's the, the, the work of man. You get the reward. But salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a free gift. And gifts are free. Requires no works, no strings attached. It is free. Okay? So when we are saved, brethren, and we see here that we please God with faith, then we ought to be people that diligently seek Him. We ought to diligently seek favor with God. You know, be in fellowship with God. Have a good, healthy relationship with the Father, right? That, that is, that's important. And again, you know, this, this idea of fellowship or relationship, you go and knock on someone's door, you know, what do you think someone has to do in order to go to heaven? Uh, have a relationship with God. Nope. <laughs> okay, that's not how you get saved. Going to heaven, knowing that you're saved, is not having a... What does that mean? When someone says that to me, you've got to have a relationship. I say, well, can it be a bad relationship? <laughs> I mean, can it be a, does it matter how bad or good that relationship is? Like, how, you know, what is the basis of that relationship? Now, in a sense, it's true. Because relationship talks about relations. And so in order to be saved, yeah, you have to be related to God. You become a child of God through faith on Christ. So yeah, if that's what they're referring to, I understand. But they're usually not referring to that. They're usually referring to, you know, uh, living godly, you know, and going to church and all that. And, you know, that's how you get saved. No, that's not true. That's not right, you know. But yes, when you are saved, 
We should diligently seek Him, right? We should desire to have favour with God, to be in His presence, to spend time with Him. This is why you're in church this morning or this afternoon, right? Because you want to learn more about God. You want to know more about His Word. You want to be able to fellowship with Him, sing Him praises, give thanks to God. This is all important, you know, in our, in our seeking after Him. But He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So the more we seek God, the greater the reward. What a blessing to know that, hey, as we seek God, as we try to live lives that please Him, you know, God's going to reward you for that. It's not a waste of time. It's not empty. He's going to, you know, see you through. He's going to make sure you get what, what's coming to you when it comes to a, a great re- reward from God. And, you know, that reward can appear on this earth. That reward could be the treasures that are laid up in heaven. Let's go to Psalm 24, verse 7 now. Psalm 24, verse 7. Don't forget these psalms are songs and poetic language, right? So, you know, don't get too confused with the language. It says here, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Okay, now, obviously, talking about Jerusalem, Mount Zion, talking about the gates of Jerusalem here, right? And so it's speaking about uh, the gates here, right? Lift up, it's, it's speaking to the gates, poetically, right? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. So it's basically saying, look, open up your gates. Open it up. Why? It says here, and the king of glory shall come in. Okay? So the language here is basically to, to obviously, yes, the, the nation of Israel and Jerusalem at that point in time. He says, look, let God in. Open up your gates. Okay? Open it up so God can be in there. And brethren, that's what we need to do. We have to be open with God. We have to allow Him to enter into our lives, you know, have fellowship with God, and spend time in prayer, spend time in church, spend time in Bible reading, spend time in fellowship with God. Now lift up your spiritual gates, as it were, and let God in, you know, fellowship with God. We don't want God to be like the, in Revelation, you know, with the church in Laodicea, where He's knocking. You know, let me in, let me in, right? People aren't fellowshipping with God. We ought to lift up those gates. But again, you know, yes, this applies to earthly Jerusalem in a sense, but notice it's pointing to heavenly Jerusalem because it says in verse number seven, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. Okay, will this earthly Jerusalem always exist? No, in fact, the gates, the, the walls have been taken down. I mean, they've been, a lot of them have been demolished and things like that, right? It's talking about everlasting gates. So obviously this is speaking about heavenly Jerusalem something that is everlasting, something that is heavenly. What this is pointing us to is the fact that when we're there, we are going to be with the King of glory. You know, the King of glory will be there, will be in the presence of God when we are in heaven. Can you please keep your finger there and go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Notice that it says there, and the King of glory shall come in. The King of glory. Revelation 21, verse 21. Revelation 21, 21. Revelation 21, 21, speaking of the gates of this heavenly Jerusalem, it says, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of that city, of the city, was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God, remember it's, Psalm talked about the King of glory? Well, he says, the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, some people have the idea, well, maybe that means there is no sun, there is no moon. It's possible. I, I'm not saying I'm, I know what it is, okay? It's not saying necessarily that there is none of that. It's just that there's no need for it, okay? Because the brightness, the light of God's glory, of His presence, outshines the sun. Okay, it it will always be lit up in heaven. Okay, the fact that uh, God will be in this city, in this heavenly Jerusalem. And so when when the psalm speaks of being lifted up, you know, the the everlasting doors, yeah, because there is an everlasting, there are everlasting gates, you know, the 12 gates with the 12 pearls, you know, all this stuff that we read about in the book of Revelation. And so you can see how this psalm is pointing to the new heavens and the new earth. Okay. And the fact that, yeah, we're going to be with God. We're going to be able to glorify God for all eternity. Go back to, go back to Psalm 24, verse number 8. Psalm 28, uh, sorry, uh, Psalm 24, verse 8. And then the question gets asked, who is this King of glory? And that's obvious for us, right? Who is the King of glory? And <laughs> this is where, you know, I think it's so important. Who is the King of glory? Who is, the, who is this God? I mean, we want to know God a little bit more, right? You go to your average church, 
and God is love, and He is love, yeah. God is merciful, and He is merciful, amen. God is long-suffering, and He is long-suffering. You know, there's a lot of great positive attributes to God that we love and adore, okay? But the psalmist wants us to know the real God of the Bible, okay? He doesn't focus on how God is just this peaceful God, you know. And look, who is, let's, let, let's answer the question. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Amen. That's the God. That's our God. A God mighty in battle. You say, no, no, he just wants peace and love all across the world. No, he's ready for war. Yeah. He's ready to take down his enemies as well. Okay? <laughs> this is the Lord. This is the King of glory. Man, these other churches that do not preach the fact that God also destroys, that he also casts the unsaved into hellfire for all eternity. Man, you know, our God is an angry God. He's angry at the wicked every day, the Bible tells us. This is the true God of the Bible. But he's also merciful. He's also loving. He's, otherwise, we'd be destroyed already. Okay? Thank God for the God of the Bible. Please, uh, if well, you guys were in Revelation, I'll get you to turn back to Revelation chapter 20, and I'll just read some other passages to you. The Lord is mighty in battle. What does that mean? That means he's fought battles before, and he's been mighty. He's been successful. He's won battles in the past. He's defeated enemies. You know, he's... He's destroyed the wicked. He's the Lord mighty in battle. You know, in Exodus 15, verse 3, it says, and notice this, it says this, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host have he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. You know, God defeated the Egyptian army. Right? He, he, I mean, in an amazing way. Right? You know, just them drowning in the sea, he destroyed them. The Bible tells us he's a man of war. You don't want to go up against God, you're going to lose. I, I'm on, I want to be on God's side. Fight from victory. Jesus Christ has already won. You know, the victory that we can have is already just in Christ. Praise God. I want to be on the winning side. <laughs> oh, man, could you imagine facing a man of war who's won many battles in the past? You know, from the very beginning we see in Exodus, God has won in war. I'll just read another passage to you, Isaiah 42, verse 13. Isaiah 42, verse 13 says, The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. A mighty man is another, a man of war, right? A man who has great victories. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar! He shall prevail against his enemies. Wow, that's Isaiah 42, verse 13. How many churches speak about this God? <laughs> this man of war. He roars, he cries out when he defeats his enemies. Wow, you know? And then in Revelation chapter 20. So the reason I wanted to look at Revelation chapter 20 is because we were looking at Revelation 21, where it speaks of, you know, the new Jerusalem, right? And how that's Mount Zion and that's the gates and we have God's glory there. But you know what? Leading into that new heaven and the new earth, God has another great battle. <laughs> so let's have a look at it very quickly. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Because before God creates the new heavens and the new earth, Jesus Christ will be ruling and reigning for a thousand years. And in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7, it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Can you, I, I cannot understand this for the life of me, brethren, but Jesus Christ, it's going to be wonderful as he rules and reigns on this earth for a thousand years. But you know, toward the end, just like man has always shown himself to be corrupt, to be sinful, to not love the Lord, somehow there's going to be people that turn against Jesus Christ, okay? Satan will be loosed. He'll be able to gather this army. They, they think, they think they're going to be able to take down Jesus. A man of war, take him down, all right? I mean, look, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. That's, got, that's going to be a huge army, huge army at the end of a thousand years, right? Coming against Jesus. But my favorite thing is how Jesus wins it. And how much 
time God gives it, it's not much of a battle. <laughs> you know, it's not much of a battle. Okay? Look at verse number uh, 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. So that, that includes us. And the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's it. Done. <laughs> it just didn't take too long to defeat his enemies. Verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. Okay? They're still there. After a thousand years, they're still being tormented. Look at this. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Listen, the lake of fire is a place that if you've been cast in there before the thousand years, you're still there for a thousand years. It continues. And not only just that, beyond that, tormented day and night, that's bad, but then forever and ever. Man, I don't want to go to war against God. Turn against Him. Well, it's not going to happen to the believers. We saw here that they, they encamp, encamp against the saints. Okay, so obviously, it's not the saints. It's not believers that are going to war against God. Okay, they're the ones being attacked. And Jesus comes, He delivers them. Fire comes from heaven. They get devoured and cast into that lake of fire and, of brim, and brimstone. Back to Psalm 24. And of course, that's the, that's the final battle. New heavens and new earth. Then we can be in Mount Zion, you know, in the church of the firstborn with God for all eternity. Psalm 24. And, and you know what? Verse number 9 and 10 is just a, re, a repeat of what we just read. Let's, so just, just read it quickly. It says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Okay, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And how did it say there in verse number eight? It said, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And so I love it when the, when the Psalms repeat themselves. Whenever the Bible repeats itself, just pay attention. It means God really wants you to focus in on that. Okay, again, who is the Lord? We want, the, God wants us to know him, right? It's not just the love and the mercy and the long suffering. Actually, our God is a, is a, is a God of great wrath, of great judgment. You know, he hates sin. He gives us so much time to turn to Jesus. He gives us time to go to our community to preach the gospel so they don't get wiped out by the man of war. Okay, it's better to join his army than fight against him. And so we just see that repetition there just to remind us of the great God that we worship and it will be for all eternity, the everlasting doors in the new Jerusalem. Let's pray.